Hi everyone, welcome to After Podium. I have a guest from Seattle and I'm live, which it rarely happens. Uh, Malia Watchers, welcome to After Podium. Thank you for having me. You know, I was uh, talking to a friend a couple of months ago. I was in LA and I was talking to a friend of mine and he asked me what I do and I told him about some of the things I do and I also said I do this podcast and he yeah. said, what inspires you to do this? And what uh, motivates you to do this, uh, especially since there's no financial thing in, in, in any of what I do with this podcast. But um, I didn't know what to answer. And I, and I told them there's a lot of things that inspire me. But uh, speaking to people like you, uh, amazing artists, is always inspiring because you do so many things. You're an educator, you're an improviser, violist, composer, so many different things. Thanks for joining me, and you're one of the people that actually inspires me and motivates me to do what I do because, you know, of all the different things that you do. So it's great to have you on. That's amazing. Thanks, Tigran. We'll start right uh, away with the question uh, yeah. of, of viola uh, because, you know, I conduct two youth orchestras, and every time I get a violist, I ask them if they played violin before or another instrument. But uh, the surprisingly, a lot of the viola kids, yeah. they've started on viola, especially yeah. in the recent years. Well, uh, did you start with the viola? I started with piano, but yeah. on stringed instruments, I did start with the viola. Interesting. Yeah. What inspired you to pick the viola? I loved viola at first sight. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in third grade, mm -hmm. a string quartet came to my school thought the violist was the coolest lady. Uh -huh. I was amazed by the whole thing, actually, but I really was taken with the viola player. Uh -huh. I didn't, you know, to me, all the instruments are great, but I, I loved her yeah. and I wanted to be like her. So I ended up taking lessons with her uh -huh. and we didn't have an orchestra program, but she ran a summer, uh, you know, not a festival, it was, you know, for camp. Yeah, yeah, say. yeah it was a camp, yeah. And uh, me and my brother went there. I was the only violist, so a sea of violinists. Uh -huh. And then she came to our school and started a little program, too. Is the family musical? Yeah, yeah. So uh, your brother is a violist, too? No, no, no. I I'm, I'm was the only one that ended up being a violist. Uh -huh. But there are seven of us, seven wow. siblings. Wow. And we all played. Some went into music professionally, but then changed. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they all played. And one thing that always is interesting for me, yeah. and you said you heard the Martin Bresdick uh, podcast. Yeah. Uh, I asked him about his last name, and your yes. last name is interesting. So what's yes. the what's the history? So my grandfather came from Poland, uh -huh. and so it's a Polish name, but he said that it was shortened. I, I haven't looked up what it was originally. Watarski. Yeah. 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 And, That's <laughs> but but where, where, where did you grow up? I oh, I grew up, uh, I was born in Hawaii, I grew up in the Midwest. When I was eight and the quartet came to my school, that uh -huh. was in Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh, so, wow. yeah. so all over the place. Over and the now place. Seattle. And now Seattle, yeah. Why Seattle? You dub. I came is here that, for the job. Is that the reason? That's right. Since, since you said you dub, I want to know why. Yeah. You know, why, why is music education important? Yeah. Oh, man, it's critical. It's been a gift in my life, having teachers, uh -huh. you know, great, amazing teachers. And it's the way we can keep music going forward. It's the connection from the past and the future. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's everything. And it's always great to have amazing artists who are exceptional at what they do outside of just teaching, but also wanting to teach. And yeah. one of those people yeah. is your teacher. No doubt. No doubt about so it. So you want to tell us a little bit about him for yeah. those who don't know? Because because the reason why I uh, got to know of his work and mm -hmm. of him yeah. is because I came to a recital of yours. Yes. And and did you see him? No. That, oh, okay. That's not the one. Yeah, okay. I, I came to one where you played a piece by him yeah. and that's when I realized I don't like, know much about music. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit yeah. about him. And Atar how Arad yeah. is my teacher, uh -huh. my now my mentor and friend. He is phenomenal. His energy, his work ethic, his artistry, his imagination. I really, when I look at what I've done in my life, I can see I really modeled myself yeah, after him. Yeah, he yeah. just inspires me in so many ways. Yeah. And talk about a master teacher. Yeah. Master teacher. Yeah. yeah. So what, what makes a master teacher? Oh, he just knows immediately what... A person needs to, to be elevated to yeah. the next level 
And he doesn't let go. Yeah. He doesn't, in his teaching, coddle you to the, like, oh, that was so lovely. It's like, okay, well, what can we do more? What, how can you get in deeper? <laughs> yeah. You know, what can, how, you know, he's the one that gave me my passion for, in art, looking for the, the seamlessness of it. You know, the seamlessness between the performer and the performance, the yeah. seamlessness between like the performer, the composer, and the listener, yeah. you know, just so that it becomes something more than itself. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, one thing that's inspiring about you and it's so great is because, uh, I, I, at least from my perspective as a student, because I came here as a student, you were on faculty, yeah. and I'd never taken lessons with you. Yeah. Uh, never, you know, I, we've never collaborated on anything, but, um, you always were so positive and you gave me time to even just say hi and talk to you. So it's, it's, it's no wonder you're successful because that's what, that's what I've realized makes people successful is because they have no agenda and they will uh, give, right. give people the time, no matter how famous or not famous or how important in their career that person will be, you give them that attention. And I've really appreciated that. Well, I mean, I appreciate hearing that and I appreciate you. I, I can't agree with you more that it's, we're all people. Mm. And if, if, you know, someone is sort of networking or there's an agenda or yeah. anything. It kind of, I mean, I know we all need things. We all want of things, course. but really there's such a bigger picture. Yeah. And again, it's me being blessed with people like that, like Atar and Mr. Gingold was the same way you, you know, when you, I know you're going to speak to my husband soon. Yeah. His teacher was <laughs> legendary. Yeah. And talk about generous. Yeah. He was also, aside from a legendary teacher, legendary. Yeah like humanitarian yeah. so yeah so yeah. what brought you to improvisation because that's yeah. one thing that's that's um, bothered me a little bit with classical music is yeah. that we're not at least uh, on the college level we're not given enough opportunities to improvise yeah and that's something that's happened in the past for classical musicians it doesn't happen anymore uh, not much right but you've been a very very you know, active in, in improvising, and I came to a concert of yours with your husband, and both of you improvised. There was a duet, I believe. I think uh, uh, Kung Wu might have even been mm -hmm. part of that trio, from mm -hmm. what I remember. And we're in his office yeah. now, yeah. so maybe I should get him on next. <laughs> totally. Uh, <laughs> but what, what brought you to improvisation coming from the classical background? Yes. First, let me say I, how important improvisation is for everybody, mm -hmm. classical or not. Notation is a limited thing. The, they're just notes on a page. Mm -hmm. So improv improvisation gives a person a, an idea of the freedom and the difficulty it is of taking that freedom and putting it on a page. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to twist a quote a little bit. Bobby Mann was legendary violence of the Juilliard string mm -hmm. quartet and he worked with us just a little bit we mainly worked with the other members of the Juilliard string quartet mm -hmm. he had retired by that time but he gave us uh, inspiring coachings here and there and one of them I vividly remember he said you should play contemporary music as if it was written a hundred years ago and you should play old music as if it was just written today yeah. Yeah. and I feel that way about improvisation that you can kind of do the same thing yeah. that you should play written music as if it has the life and the freedom and the, the scariness of yeah. improvisation and you should improvise with the assuredness, well, I mean, you don't want all of it, but you know that it has that care and course, thought that a written piece, because there's time when you yeah. have a written piece. So now I've completely lost track of your original question, because oh, no, I'm just I, talking about the about importance of it. Improvisation is very, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's great. I, I just, what got you there? Yeah, so what got me there was how did it begin maybe it's a good thing that you don't remember how it began yeah, because, because maybe it was, it was just so much bits. a part of your life or just no it came it came later because i remember in high school thinking when i would hear it like wow i have to practice my skills what yeah. are they doing you yeah. know and then it wasn't until later that i realized oh that's quite valuable yeah. what they're doing yeah. um and it was little by little but i think it started with composers like in pieces that it would have little of things of oh suddenly improvise or do this and yeah. improvise. so it started a little bit like that and then I uh, joined a group open-ended two things started happening at the same time 
I joined a group, Open End, uh -huh. and that was run by a composer, performer, Andrew Wagoner, uh -huh. and he wanted the group to be improvisation, written piece, you know, yeah. staggered throughout the, each, each concert yeah. that we gave. So we started improvising with him. Yeah. And then I was working with Richard Carpenter on his piece, Aperture. Okay. That he it was really, he would improvise with me yeah. to write the piece. So that's how we got to writing the piece. So, And then I graduated, you know, you know, I just started practicing improvisation and started realizing how much I needed it when I was playing Bach and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And then you mentioned, you know, opportunities in, in school, when yeah. you're in school to yeah. do improvisation. And then I realized that is exactly what my students need to be doing. So... They actually improvise in our studio class. Oh, wow. They put it on their recitals sometimes. Wow. They each come in with their own uh, improvisation projects, and they're stunning. To hear. Yeah. Let me tell you, some yeah. of them are really the ideas they have. One one of my students, um, she came in with the idea that her and her partner, because they usually team up or they okay. bring someone outside yeah. the class yeah. and friends, that they would read a poem while improvising, but that the audience would not see the poem. Oh, wow. I thought it was so beautiful. Yeah. And I was talking to Larry Starr and stuff, and Larry said, oh, I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I forgot what symphony, but the horn player yeah. during the symphony is reading a yeah. poem and is then supposed to play. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's great, and I'm happy this is happening. I just wish it was happening more, you yeah. know, in more, in more departments. Do you, do you think that might be in the future? I think it might be. I think improvisation is making a big comeback all throughout classical music. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's starting to enter more curriculums. Because I think, uh, you know, I, I did this with my Bainbridge Island Youth Orchestra, and yeah. I keep saying this, uh, I had kids, uh, well, we had a solo, uh, we had a guest, Andrew Jocelyn, he's a violinist, uh, he does mostly pop and rock, he's played with a lot of renowned pop artists, yeah. and he came in and he did this uh, master class teaching them how to play film music and all this stuff, and Love so I, I, had the, I had the idea of having the kids play a couple of chords and have some of them come up and improvise, yes. and it was absolutely surprising yes. how many of them just were natural and they weren't worried about actually improvising, and these are like That's 10, right. 12, 13, 14 year olds who didn't have experience and I just said you know this is the scale we're playing these are the chords that's so right. they just played and and it was absolutely amazing I was completely shocked I love that I love hearing that and I think it's so true it kind of makes me think you know how Suzuki said you know that that music is a mother tongue uh -huh. for for young people I I couldn't agree with you more so I would love to see, you know, I'll encourage my students if they teach younger, because I don't teach younger pupils, yeah, but, you know, to have them improvise yeah. and, you know, um, yeah, I think that's beautiful. I I also felt that young people, you know what, we would go out to schools a lot and uh -huh. play for public schools. But again, just that's how I started. Of course, I'm going to do that. I, I want to, you know, make sure everybody really loves Gilda as much as I yeah. do. But I found in these trips that the five-year-olds were really keen on contemporary music. Yeah. On Ives. They got it right away. Yeah. They're like, what is he doing? Yeah. Oh, he's he's mixing different things exactly yeah. at the same time. They had no and no prejudices. It was just it's openness. Really it's quite beautiful. Yeah. And you get someone who's 18 and 20 with no experiences like that, and they they think it's weird. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. I just wish... See, this is why it's so important to get out there and, and give yeah. kids opportunities to listen to music. Yeah. And especially especially in today's world where, you know, programs, uh, there aren't too many public school music programs. And also, it's sad because, you know, the population of the world is growing. So you might yes. think, you know, the, the orchestras should be growing. But, you know, I, the, the latest example that I always bring up is the Santa Barbara Chamber Orchestra, which was a part-time orchestra, but they folded. And, so sad. And, 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 and what is really the future of orchestral music? You've been around for lo a little bit longer than I have. <laughs> yes. Uh, tell, me, tell me what you've seen and it, the, does orchestral music really have a future? And I'll ask this to your husband, which I'll answer yes. next. But, and I'll be interested to hear what his answer yeah. is. Well, I mean, I don't really know what the future is. And I loved Bresnik's response saying that music will always be here. I thought that was a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing. It does seem to me, though, that this issue has been there for as long as I can remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it 
doesn't, it's like we get a little bit of change and then it doesn't change, you know, like that there's always been a problem with audience, then, you know, so I, I don't know. My hope is that the view of orchestra becomes um, open, uh -huh. that the repertoire that's played is a little more adventurous, yeah. uh, that the audiences that it reaches are um, open. Yeah, there are so many, there's so many layers to this issue, it's hard to even choose. But are one. we doing something wrong? Is there something on the musician's end? Because we, I've realized that a lot of musicians tend to say, well, the audiences don't understand, they don't do this, they don't do that, uh, and they won't like what we're playing here because it's not Beethoven's fifth and they won't understand, so we're right. going to play Beethoven's fifth right. again instead of something new. So it's always, we always try to somehow blame it on the audiences. Are we doing something wrong or are, are, we, are we okay? Um, it, it, well, no, we can, everybody can always change. Of course. Everybody can always be better, and I certainly wouldn't blame any particular person. I think, you know, or like audience or, or group of people, one thing in the string world that happens mm -hmm. that's difficult, and strings make up a large yeah, number yeah, of, of the orchestra, it's hard to afford an instrument. So right away, you're cutting off a big part of the population yeah. in terms of access to instruments. Yeah, yeah. It's not hopeless. There are great programs. Um, El Sistema, yeah. um, Rachel Barton Pine has a yeah. foundation. There's great stuff happening here in Seattle. Yeah. I have a couple of students that had support. So it's not as if it's hopeless, but that is a hurdle yeah. that stream players face. Yeah. I faced it myself. Yeah. And obviously everything is relative. Yeah. So there are people who have harder times yeah. than I did. I was lucky in a lot of ways. But I did go to Indiana with a five hundred dollar viola and was shocked yeah. Yeah. at what yeah. I encountered. So I think right there we have an issue because that means that you have a group of people not learning an instrument and it's so much easier to appreciate something you, you've understood. Yeah. Like, if so many people take dance classes. Of course. So they appreciate dance more, yeah. you know, because they can see these steps yeah. were quicker or something. Yeah. So, I don't know, that's one thing. I don't it's offer a, it's any tough, solution. It's a tough but topic. Yeah, yeah. Going back to viola, you know, you've, you've done all these, all these different projects. So what's one that comes to mind maybe the, uh, right away or something that you really felt inspired by doing, whether it was a recording or a new piece that you played, something that comes to mind right away when you think about your career. Of my yeah. own projects yeah. or not anybody else's? Your projects. My projects. Okay. Well, I'm kind of like always going to the next thing, yeah. but I was super excited to do the Schumann project, uh -huh. which will be the next CD. I mean, we finished the master recently, okay. and so it'll be the next one that comes out. That was pretty awesome, uh -huh. just because Schumann's American Builder yeah. is a phenomenal piece. Yeah. Schumann is a phenomenal composer. Yeah. I got to play again with, I'm so lucky that there are so many great people here to yeah. work with, and I got to pull in Winston Choi, who right. I played Schumann American Builder at Indiana with so he came out here yeah. and he was something yeah he was something else not only on the Schumann not only did he have these amazing insights so that we're working together and it's a totally different approach than we had when we were together yeah. in school but Richard Carpenter wrote a piece so what that project was I should explain it is it's all based on Schumann's American Builder yeah. that was the starting point and then Kung Vu myself and Richard Carpen wrote pieces inspired by it. Wow! And um, so I wrote a piece, several pieces actually that are on that disc. But you know, it doesn't have to be specific. It could just it could be loose too. Okay. But I'm gonna focus on Richard's piece for just a second because he gave this devil of a piece for Winston in particular. Mike too, really. Mike and Winston just yeah. really worked hard on that piece but Winston was like it's like gymnastics all over the <laughs> fingerboard and uh, 
Winston, I don't think he understood what I was saying, but I told him before, okay, we're not editing this. Like, we start, you go. Yeah. You know, we might have a stopping point, but I, we're not going to edit this. Yeah. Uh, it's just got to be done yeah. like a performance. So, basically. So, somehow, he didn't quite process that until we were close to the time. He stayed up all night getting this thing. But he also developed a new technique in advance, which I thought was so cool. Uh -huh. He had studied Glenn Gould, uh -huh. and Glenn Gould had studied jugglers. Uh -huh. And jugglers, you know, they imagine the movement, uh -huh. and they physically move their hands yeah. the way they're imagining yeah. the balls. Yeah. So Winston would rewrite in the rest the upcoming very difficult passage, and he would just mimic the movement and put it in his short-term memory. And the thing where Mike comes in too is that Mike was conducting the whole thing while he was playing. Wow. So and Mike's part was hard. So wow. not only was he trying to play his own part and making it, you know, sound good, but he was conducting me and Winston. Wow. So Winston during the rest could do his mimic uh -huh. and then Mike would cue him in so that Winston didn't, you know, have to count. Yeah. So so that was pretty phenomenal. Okay. So this is going back to a different topic, but yeah. you'll have some of your students maybe listen to this. You'll have some of your viola fans or just musicians in general. Okay. Again, it's a tough question. Okay. And all of these are tough. I'm scared. But <laughs> but how does one uh, have a career like you? Oh, like me? Uh, what that's... does it take? What does it take to, to have a successful career as a violist or as a musician in general? What does it take? There's many things, but what... what well, the number one what thing advice? is work yeah. above everything else. Yeah. I think you hear that a lot, yeah. but it's really true. Yeah. You know, talent gets you so far. There's so many people who are talented, yeah. and of course you need talent, but really you have to work. Yeah. And you have to work at the right things. I understand we have to have a career and that you have to do things to get publicity and all that, yeah. but really, for me, the work should has to and needs to be focused on the music uh -huh. and why are you making music why are you playing why are you composing and really playing a stringed instrument is hours a day yeah, I mean, yes yeah, just you lose it very fast the tactile the intonation you need to have the subtlety so it's just time yeah so <laughs> Yeah. Work, but what advice? What advice do you give to your students, for example? Oh, maybe your graduate for, students or masters, doctoral yes. students. What advice do you give them for their careers? Yeah, I mean, I, you help them be a great, great musician. That's first. Thing. Yes, but what's what's after that? That's what? the most important. I think just be as the best person you can possibly be. Have as many friends. I like to call it friend, not yeah. networking, because yeah. again, it's that not having an agenda thing. Yeah. Like, just care about people, care about your community, yeah. and good things will happen. We are, it, it has changed yeah. so much. Yeah. The scene has just been dramatically shifting, yeah. and it will continue to do yeah. so because nothing is settled. Um, there are only so many orchestral jobs. Yeah. Yeah. And just a little side note, there's a great article by Atar in Strings Magazine talking about the way we teach students to get orchestral jobs and you know, how maybe we could rethink some yeah. of those things. Anyway, um, yeah, being the best person, it sounds a little naive as I'm saying it, so I don't mean, I don't, I don't mean to say that it isn't going to be a struggle, because it is going to be. Yeah. There's no doubt about yeah. it. But who goes into music not knowing that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I try to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, if you have something else that you love as much as music, and that makes my, go do that other yeah, thing and then yeah, enjoy music. Yeah. But it's like you have to just be a little bit crazy. You have to have an unbelievable desire to want to do this. Yeah. And you'll figure it out. I mean, yeah. that sounds, like, again, a little rough maybe. But by the world shifting, the musical world shifting, it actually gives some opportunities that are new. Yeah. Yes, their orchestra jobs are the same in terms of many, many people auditioning for very, very few spots. But nowadays, you can have 
electronic equipment record you and you could release your own disc you can yeah. get yourself out there yeah. in so many yeah. different ways yeah. so i think being you know improvising in your career as well mm -hmm. and figuring out what you need to do one thing i do tell my students and i t try to tell myself this too is to balance your unhappiness because if you're happy with how you play, with how you write, with how you're improvising, with how you teach, with a, well, then you're not doing a very good job. Yeah. You know, because as soon as you think that, woo, yeah. some, some, everybody else is going to speed on exactly. right by you. Yeah. However, life is hard because we're constantly unhappy with the, what, the way we play, the way we compose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you don't want to become... Uh, inactive because you're so unhappy with the thing so it's just balancing that yeah that work and that drive yeah, yeah, yeah. with with smelling the roses occasionally yeah. you know the composing yeah and you you premiered a lot of pieces and you uh, you were also um you also had pieces dedicated to you a couple of works how does that collaboration work? Because it's always always interesting when you premiere a piece or a piece is dedicated to you. Is there some kind of a yeah. performer composer relationship that happens? It depends on the on the composer, uh -huh. really. And you start more so more so than the soloist. Yeah. yeah, because if the composer wants input, he'll ask for it. Okay. And if not, then they don't. <laughs> what are some that come to mind? Well, like Shulamit Ron. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't want to hear any of my recordings. She didn't want to hear me playing anything beforehand. Uh -huh. And uh, I get in the mail this finished piece yeah. that it's glorious. Yeah. You know, so it basic. she just wrote the piece. Oh. Um, uh, Garth, we had done projects together uh, and played together. And then he wrote Stranger for he and, and myself. Mm -hmm. And Kung Wu, I guess, would say is actually more of a polar opposite even than Garth to Shulamit Ron Kung. We worked together on projects, then we talked about, you know, different viola things, and um, so that was more collaborative in the process. Although I mean, it's completely his piece. Yeah. Well, and then also Richard's having me improvise with him. That's pretty collaborative. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it just depends. Uh. And by the way, if Kung is listening, sorry, I mispronounced your name. I just realized. Uh, oh, no, uh, don't go by my pronunciation. I say it wrong. Oh, okay. I know I say it incorrectly, and I try, but I can't quite say it right. I don't, I don't have the knack for saying it right, and he told me it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, but, but don't go by me. <laughs> since you, you're collaborating with jazz musicians, you're collaborating with composers, is there somehow... Uh, more collaboration happening between jazz and classical musicians now than ever? I don't know. Or is it just it a might, Seattle thing? <laughs> it's, for me, it's just a friend thing. I see. It's like, I like these people. I like their artistic vision. I like what they do. That's how I work. And I wish I wish this was how it was uh, at, at every place, though. Because it would it would just open up so many new new places we could go with music. Because nowadays, well, not nowadays, but a lot of people we we grew up and it's it's not no one's fault, but we grew up you know with classical musicians. So the only collaborations we're gonna do are with classical, classical. musicians. And and we also have this mindset where you know we can't it, it can't be viola and saxophone, for example. It has to you know if you're a violist, right. then you play in a quartet or something. Right. You know. So, so somehow, somehow in the education system, we have to, as educators, at least give the, the, the young students the, the ideas for them to be open to these things. Absolutely. And we all have the power to yeah, do that. Yeah. I have that. You have yeah. that with your youth orchestra. Yeah. I think those are such amazing things that you've already told me that yeah. you do with them. So you could pair them with different yeah. jazzers or yeah, yeah, have yeah. different people come in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, again, uh, going back to another topic that always interests me is competitions, and I've had yes. mixed feelings about competitions. Yeah. What are your feelings? Because because you're you're com coming from a different perspective because you've actually been successful at a competition at a big one. Um. Yeah, my feelings about competitions. I think. Well, you know the bar top quote, right? Oh yes, of yeah. course, of course, of course. <laughs> the, the horses. Yeah. yeah. Right. There are four horses. Um. 
So, and I think there is something to that quote. I mean, I agree because just because you won a competition doesn't mean you were the best one. It means you were possibly the best one that day, or you were the best one in that judge's eyes, yeah. or something else. Maybe you had something that bothered someone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it can get, you know, it can get to a level where it becomes subjective. Uh -huh. Not always. Yeah. I mean, there is definitely objectivity, you know, but even intonation can yeah. be subjective. Of course. You know? Of course. So, yeah, that, that could be a killer. Yeah. But I, I understand they can give people a, a step. So sometimes that can be great. And, you know, the other good thing about competitions is learning the repertoire. For example, I, I didn't enter it myself because it's a violin competition, but Indianapolis violin competition was something that as students, we always went up to Indianapolis to see. Yeah. And it was pretty awesome. Yeah. And the amount of repertoire they had to learn was huge. So getting through all of that repertoire and just getting in your fingers is a good thing. However, that being said, my, you know, Atara Rod would always say, don't enter a competition if you just want to learn stuff, you, you know, just play a concert. Yeah. If you're going to enter a competition, enter to win. Yeah. So I agree with that. I agree. I see that. Yeah. Um, it, it pushes you. So those are good things. It helps you with that drive and pushing through. I think as long as a perspective is maintained that it doesn't really mean like everything yeah, it doesn't yeah. it's not the be all end all yeah you know there's so many kids disappointed i've seen so many discouraged discouraged but isn't people. that part of learning yeah of course of course i mean i'm not saying i, I enjoy it yeah. i went through that myself yeah. it's not a fun process yeah. but if losing a competition is going to keep you from your passion then maybe it wasn't your passion good point yeah yeah you know what I want to know? Yeah. Uh, one thing that was interesting when I was reading about you trying to get all these things uh, to uh, have some, some things to talk about, yeah. the Gart Knox video yeah. project, yeah. tell me about that. What's that? Oh my gosh, it was so fun. <laughs> it was really so fun. So as I said, I just feel lucky that I get to be with people I love and enjoy and can hang out with. And Garth is amazing. Yeah. Have you gotten to hang out with him? Never, but uh, seen him play, but never. He's Amazing. Yeah. Not only is he amazing, he is just one of those musicians that's constantly searching, oh. and I love that. Yeah. And he's fun. Yeah. His music tell is his personality. Yeah. It is just fun. Yeah. And what I loved about those videos that we did together for his viola duos, he came up with the staging of them. Wow. He came in and said, I want us facing, I want us front. He goes, this one's like we're drunk at a bar, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. this one we're playing. And then Adam, uh, I can't remember his last name, the videographer, did a fabulous job. Uh -huh. um, he, of course, would come with the technical know how to do it, but Garth really had stages or sort of plays uh -huh. and choreography yeah. with it that he would have us do some movement, yeah. a little bit of movement, you know, not outrageous, but I thought that was phenomenal, you know. Like the harmonic uh, one, uh -huh. he had us all look, he, both yeah. of us looking up to, yeah. you know, catch the harmonics yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. It really adds to the music and it gives it more of a whole performance. And he wanted us to wear different clothes for each video, yeah. which I also thought was a good idea. Yeah. He just wanted each piece to have its own feeling and he, I just... Yeah, it was just There aren't really music fun. videos. There aren't too many music videos for, you know, or just artistic yeah. artistic works like those in the classical music world. I know. I think we should have more. Yeah. They're really enjoyable. Yeah. And, and enjoyable from both sides, both the audience and the performer I who's agree. actually doing something different than they were, they're used to doing. Exactly. I asked you, but I, I want to ask you again, what inspires you to do what you do, waking up every morning, doing what you do, what, what, what's the inspiration? Man, I take inspiration from I, everything. I Sometimes I wake up and I'm just smiling, I'm like, oh, I get to do bowings today. <laughs> <laughs> I get to put in fingerings today. Yeah. It's like, I can't believe that I get paid to work in music. Yeah and to work with people I enjoy, yeah. and students who inspire me. Yeah. 
so yeah it's the people it's the music it's the getting to express things to search for answers together not that we'll ever find them but you know that that's what music is yeah. for me is you know why are we here yeah. what are we doing you know um this is another example of getting to work with people i really admire Catherine connors is head of the classics department uh -huh. here at university of washington she's phenomenal she uh -huh. is so inspiring she is so knowledgeable about the classics. Oh. So um, I, my piece Source, which is based, which is part of the Schumann project, ends with, well, the first movement ends with a quote from the Aeneid. So I went to her and I told her, can you say this and then I'll do it? And, or could you help me show in the music how one would say it? And it blew my mind with the way she took time from her busy schedule to teach me yeah. how to speak Latin, to give me the courage to go on stage and speak Latin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's very, you know, you have to get the accents right. And I'm a little bit of a, I have a little bit of a drawl, you know. So I didn't want to be this hick yeah. Latin, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, so inspiring to me. And she said something in one of our meetings. She said that the ancients believed that music already existed before us. That we're just tapping into playing things that already are there. So that connection across time, across space, is huge. Yeah. I mean, I think that's amazing. And you know, she would explain how Orpheus's lyre has seven strings, and that each string could represent to the ancients a dimension or a or another reality yeah, yeah. um that's really amazing yeah and it's great because you actually reached out and wanted this collaboration so i just yes. i just i just hope that we as, as classical musicians especially the young generations coming up they don't they don't think about it as so separated from each other i mean if you want to collaborate with someone from the math department find a way to do it it, it, it yeah. really doesn't have to be so um, in, in, in such a small square space of just classical music and, and it's very right. important in the 21st century especially with you know again there are many organizations that are doing wonderful things but then there are yes. organizations who are shutting down and not doing That's well right. so it's very important for us to collaborate help each other doesn't That's matter right. what from where and what department and jazz and you know, literature and ma whatever it might be, it's very important to do these things. Um, one thing that I, I ask um, some of my guests, and I asked this Martin Bresnik, he actually talked about it a little bit, but I also asked Robert Dick and others who have been on uh, the, the the inequality in music, oh, which yes. which which uh, you know you, you you might want to share some stories or you might want to talk about but I, I want to know your perspectives uh, both both racial if you want to talk about that but also you know gender yeah uh, you know female composer or a woman composer and all these different things and it's actually funny I can't remember who I was yeah. talking to and she said you know there's this uh, one festival I was invited to and it said uh, women composers and I talked to the organizers and I just didn't want it to be that way I, yeah I'm a composer that's I don't right want it. I don't want that extra word I just she felt so frustrated with it but but some some of your thoughts and and where we are now and where we were maybe 20 years ago or so yeah it's been a long time that we have this issue of, and it's such a big, complex one. Just quickly, and then I'll get get to the main point of your question. For me as a composer, I don't face that so much simply because I'm not really, I'm not a composer composer. No. I'm a performer composer. Yeah. It's a different thing. Yeah. So I don't, I don't teach composition. I don't, you know, it's... Performer composers are, in my opinion, incredibly important. Yeah. I mean, Sarasate, they're like a huge part of musical history, yeah. and um, it's making a comeback. But it does mean I'm not in that same thing of, oh, let's hide. At least I'm, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm a little bit of an outsider, yeah. which kind of suits me anyway, yeah. because... I'm a violist. We're yeah. a little bit of an outsider there too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I seem to always be on that way. Um, but the inequality thing is is big 
you know, I don't even know how to start. Again, I think it goes back in terms of, for classical music, the cost of the instrument. Yeah. So you have large groups of people who are not able to afford private lessons, yeah. the transportation to get yeah. to these lessons. I mean, yeah. private lessons are very expensive yeah, are. and you need yeah. to have a great teacher yeah. when you're young. Yeah. The younger, the better yeah. in a stringed instrument because yeah. it really has to become part of your body. Of so by the time you get to college, it's too late. Yeah. And by the time you get to college, say you get a full scholarship, you still have to pay for your living expenses. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that was a big, uh, I had to put myself through school, you know, the right from freshman year. So, and then there, are, you know, again, I'm not saying I'm like the, the big example. I'm just saying, you know, that this, this happened. So again, I don't think it's hopeless. Just because I have seen, even in Seattle, some of my students have either sponsors or there's like Kamini yeah. Junior High yeah. was a great school for a while. You know, there are programs that do do reach out. It's just we need more, yeah, <laughs> and we need support. The arts need support, yeah. Yeah. and that's always been difficult. Yeah. Um, what does Malia Watches do outside of music? Yeah. Well, everything ties into music. I try to tie it in. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't do it. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, I don't have time. But I love Pilates. Huh. I'm, I'm an avid Pilates wow. uh, person. And my teacher is actually a violist, a former violist, as well as a gymnast. Yeah. So he knows. Like, I'm constantly... He's actually transformed my playing because I would go in all the time. I have these neck problems. Huh. And he'll say, well, you know, your warm-up. Because I have to stretch before yeah. I practice. Yeah. He'll say, you know, you're doing, we need to change your warm-up, your stretching routine. Yeah. So yeah. it's really helped me in my playing. Uh -huh. But I love Pilates and I love that mind-body connection. And I love just, I mean, I love movies. I love reading. And all of that you can tie into music. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I love walking. Yeah. You know. Which you could tie into music. You could totally tie into music. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last recording you've heard, or if you don't remember, what's a recording you recommend? Ooh. Just something that maybe comes to mind right away. Okay, immediately that comes to mind is Ludoslavsky's, I'm going to pronounce it terribly, but it's like Espace du Sommeil uh -huh. with the uh, feature discal, Insane, uh -huh. that's Insanity. But there are so many good recordings, like that's just the one that first popped into my head. I love listening to recordings. Oh, um, is Steven Israelis uh -huh. playing any Schumann? <laughs> is so good because he's obsessed with Schumann yeah. and yeah. like he put gut strings on his shit. It just sounds yeah. sounds delicious. Yeah. Like what else is someone like Tara Rod playing anything? <laughs> really, <laughs> it's behold. Like his sound is just glorious. Well, one more question. Yeah. What was the turning point in your life when you realized you wanted to be a musician? It never happened. It always was wow. what I was going to do. Wow. It was, I was lucky to go to, a, I went to a public school, but in the public school there was a performing arts uh -huh. magnet, and they gave us free private lessons. Wow. We were not in the regular curriculum. We had music theory. We had um, music history. We had humanities you know and we gigged a lot and I just started playing a professional orchestra when I was in high school so it just naturally always went that way that was the way I had the most education that was the way that just was natural yeah well I hope that school still exists I think it does I just was there between concerts in the summer and I saw my old a high school orchestra director wow. who I love, Mike, <laughs> Mike Mangan. He used to, in his office, have a coat hanger and it said, Teacher Dearest. <laughs> you know, like, Mommy Dearest. It's so funny. He's so, he made it such a joy, joyous experience, yeah. you know, playing music. But yeah, I get, he's re since retired. But I think that magnet is still going. I hope so. I hope we so. need We need a lot of places like that. We do. What have we missed? There's, Many more things we could talk about. What 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 do you want to add? I don't have anything. To add. <laughs> well, it's been it's been great talking with you. It's been a pleasure.
What's next for you? A concert or a recording? You, you mentioned a little bit, but what's next? Right now, I'm tr copying out pieces so that I can... Because I have a whole bunch coming up this year. Uh -huh. So I have I had scheduled this time slot right now to, to finish composing. Okay. So I'm just trying to wrap some of that up. Okay. And then, yeah, then I have the concerts. Yeah, Cornish. Right. And then I'm really busy. Perfect. Spring, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. <laughs>